The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's ECEPS webinar, Golden Goose, Celebrating Science Through Storytelling. I am Matt Owens. I'm the Vice President for Federal Relations and Administration at the Association of American Universities, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. Uh, I'm very delighted because it's something I've worked on for several years, and I'm joined by two colleagues that I'll introduce in a moment uh, to talk about the Golden Goose Award. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the award recognizes a scientist who's federally sponsored uh, research had tremendous human and economic benefits, even though their work may have sounded obscure or even silly uh, at the time. Uh, we are very fortunate to hear from Julia Smith, Senior Federal Relations Officer at the Association of American Universities, one of my colleagues, and Aaron Heath, uh, Associate Director of Government Relations at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Julia and Aaron have been instrumental uh, to the, both the creation and the annual execution of the award since its inception. At one point, it was just an idea that was floated by Representative Jim Cooper uh, that no one really knew how to make happen. Uh, for years, it was just an idea that assumed Congress should give the award, but no one could quite figure out how to make it happen and still abide by congressional and federal ethics rules. But one day, when a few of us were discussing the idea with Representative Cooper's staff, we did something inherent to the scientific method. We asked a different question and tested our assumptions. We asked, what if Congress didn't give the award, and instead organizations like AAU and AAAS did so? That changed everything, and it was through the creative ideas and efforts and energies of Julia, Aaron, and many others in the founding organizations of the award um, that made this award go and, that, and why it exists today. So with that brief introduction, let me now turn to Aaron, who will walk you through uh, our, some of our uh, opening slides here. Thank you, Matt. First, a little bit of history. Hold on, sorry. There, oh, there, great. About, well, first of all, a little bit about the Golden Sweeps Award, not the Golden Goose Award. The Golden Sweeps Award was an award given out in the 1970s and 80s by Senator William Proxmire. It was meant to draw attention to what he considered wasteful government spending, including often federally funded research. Two decades later, another member of Congress, Jim Cooper from Tennessee, had an idea to turn this narrative on its head and showcase federally funded research that has had a major economic or societal impact. We don't always know where research leads, right? Sometimes research it was sounds downright silly, but it can end up changing the world. Congressman Cooper wanted to tell these stories, so he reached out to our organization to help make it happen, and the Golden Goose Awards launched in 2012. Uh, so we built, uh, we have the, the small gaggle you see here of, um, of founding organizations that uh, began outreach to uh, other members of Congress because we wanted first and foremost, to have strong congressional support uh, for the award. And we, we, uh, we keep a small group of congressional sponsors, supporters that, um, that are bicameral, bipartisan, uh, because we think that's an important message to send, that science uh, is, is nonpartisan. And so uh, we have um, a bipartisan congressional um, support system in place for the award. Um, the members that that support the award are asked throughout the year to keep, um, we work with their uh, congressional staff, updating them on uh, the selection committee process, the awards that are being selected, uh, the federal um, funding agencies that will be highlighted each year. And we work with the members directly um, so that they have uh, stories from past years to use as examples that they know um, if there is a state connection um, to one of their colleagues, that they can reach out to them to tell them about this federally funded research that happened in their state. So they become messengers um, of, of the Golden Goose message. And also, uh, the, the best part, I think, for them is that they get to speak at the beginning 
of each annual ceremony that we host, um, which is uh, both enjoyable for them and also a really powerful moment for our uh, awardees when they come, they fly into D.C. and they get to sit there and, and hear members of Congress talk about why this is important and the role that they play um, in, in uh, the impact of their research nationwide. Um, the first ceremony, uh, as, as Matt mentioned, uh, Aaron and I were, were in um, early days in the Golden Goose um, creation process. So we knew we were working on something that we thought was incredibly important. This is, you know, for the founding organizations, this is kind of what we do, our daily bread and butter, but this is a, a new way of presenting it. Um, and we knew that our idea was a good one when we had our first ceremony in the Gold Room, Rayburn House Office Building, we had a standing room only crowd. And so surely if you're violating fire code, that is a good sign that your message <laughs> is, is reaching a broad audience. Um, uh, this is actually Charles Towns is one of our, he's a Nobel laureate um, for his work on uh, the maser, which led to laser technology. Is one of our uh, awardees from the first year and probably the runaway crowd favorite um, at that ceremony. So uh, during the ceremony, another uh, thing that we do is we air a documentary video that we produce throughout the year that tells uh, the story of each of the three research uh, stories that, is hi that are highlighted and being awarded. Um, so if you're asking yourself what Matt described what a Golden Goose um, award is, uh, so what does a story look like? Um, so I'll give you one of my personal favorite examples, which is uh, the, the rat infant massage story. Um, and that is that uh, there was a team of NIH-funded researchers at Duke um, who discovered uh, through process of elimination and observation that tactile stimulation was a necessary factor in the brain development of rat pups. Um, this discovery came from replicating the tactile motion a mother rat performed when aggressively licking her pups during early development. They observed this, but they didn't necessarily make the connection that this is what was the defining characteristic in the development of the brain stem, um, that, that they were not being able to reproduce any other way. Uh, so the lead researcher from this team was at a NIH study section meeting and met a researcher from the University of Miami School of Medicine and was telling her about this rat massage research that they were doing, which was not the original intent that they had set out to study, but it, they kind of started focusing on that, and he thought, you know, he'd share. She found it very fascinating. She was Dr. Tiffany Field, um, and she was working on pediatric developmental research. She then uh, went back to Miami and began applying a similar tactile stimulation to premature infants in her own NIH-funded work and discovered immediate positive effects in growth rates. Uh, brain development and alertness. Um, so her research then led to infant massage, becoming standard practice in hospitals around the world, which has shortened NICU stays by an average of six days. And this technique um, has also gone on to reduce annual healthcare costs in the United States by about 27 or 20, yeah, 26 billion dollars annually. Um, I, my personal connection for why I think this award is so great is that uh, three days before we awarded this team uh, at the Library of Congress, a little boy was born in Gwangju, South Korea, who would later become my son. And in his adoption file, when we were going through it, I found out that uh, since he was born premature at 32 weeks, he had actually received infant massage in a hospital in South Korea. Um, and I got to make the connection with the date and the time we had given this award. And it's like, wow, that's crazy uh, that there's this connection. And, and I get credit for we, we supported the award before I even knew that I had a personal <laughs> connection. So that's, that's one example. I'm going to kick it to Aaron to give another uh, great example of um, uh, Golden Goose research that, uh, that is super relevant still today. Well, I can't stop that, but I can <laughs> tell you a little bit about screwworms. Screwworms are agricultural pests that during the early to mid 20th century killed livestock, wildlife, and even some people around across the American South. And by the 1950s, Cattle losses and efforts to monitor and treat cattle for screwworm infections cost American ranchers millions of dollars a year. Enter U.S. Department of Agricultural Science, Agriculture Scientists Edward F. Nickling and Raymond C. Bushland. They pioneered a sterile insect technique that laid the groundwork for an international campaign to eradicate the screwworm fly. 
It involves rendering the screw worms sterile by exposing them to radiation. Now, thanks to this research, the screw worm no longer plagues us to nearly the same extent. Now, when it does crop up, as it did in Florida recently with a resurgence that killed a rare breed of deer, the release of sterile screw worm flies is still the go to approach. So, the sterile insect technique continues to inform fights against a variety of pests. It has saved the U.S. livestock industry billions of dollars and reduced the price of beef, beef at the supermarket. Federally funded research on the sex life of the screw worm fly is a classic example of odd sounding research producing enormous returns. Back over to you, Julia. Sure. So, uh, where are we now? Um, the award ceremony, as we said, was, was pretty popular, and so we kept getting these standing room only crowds. So we decided to move to a larger venue um, and began hosting the ceremony in September uh, at the Library of Congress. And now we fill the auditorium in uh, the uh, Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, uh, followed by a reception in the Great Hall. You'll see uh, we have uh, agency heads come uh, to attend the, the ceremony every year. Uh, France Cordova from NSF looks forward to it um, and has been uh, a proud advocate of the Golden Goose Award. Uh, Francis Collins has come uh, two, two years in a row to the awards ceremony. Um, and this year we're actually working on getting agency leaders to, act, to present the actual awards. Um, for those uh, that received the invitation to participate in today's webinar through the ESET listserv, you will have also received within that email an invitation to the September 27th Golden Goose Award ceremony and reception at the Library of Congress beginning at 5.30 p.m. We hope you'll join us. Uh, that link will also be made available uh, within the next week on the Golden Goose Award website for those that are interested in registering uh, to attend. We invite uh, congressional staff uh, with uh, science portfolio issues to attend. We invite uh, members of Congress we invite, every member of Congress is invited to attend the award. We, we uh, put in a little bit of extra work on members um, from states that are tied to the research. We're doing things a little bit differently this year. Uh, we've announced throughout the year in the past which awardees will be receiving the award and where they receive their federal funding. This year, we're actually waiting for the week of the, um, the ceremony to make those announcements, um, kind of throw the hype a little bit. So there will be some teaser videos released through our website, our Facebook, and our um, um, Twitter accounts in the coming weeks to get you even more excited, but I promise you a very good show. But as we have Frank says now um, as our uh, moderator, or our MC, and he'll be uh, hosting again this year, he opened two years ago with the sentence, that the Golden Goose Awards was like uh, the Oscars for geeks, <laughs> which was well received. Um, this is just uh, you know what what we're kind of looking for as far as stories are concerned. Um, the 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 basics that we try the boxes that we try to check in in um, in a Golden Goose story. Uh, another thing that we do throughout the year is that each member of Congress that sponsors the award has available in their office, and these are also available on our website under each story, a one-pager that concisely uh, shares the story, uh, gives some information about the researchers that were involved in the work, where they received their federal funding, and also uh, their alma maters and where the research was done to kind of give you the university uh, connection to, to the work. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we have the documentary film crew that comes to, to meet with each awardee, helps them tell their story on film, and each of those films is also available on our website throughout the year and is also shared with the press so that they can clip anything that they need for, for their stories. Um, and we also encourage our awardees and, and assist them in writing op-eds. Uh, we had a few of our awardees do some op-eds around the country because they represent a wide swath of, of states um, and universities, so getting their opinions out in local papers are, are, is incredibly valuable. Leading up to the March for Science this year, we actually had three op-eds placed by Golden Goose awardees in papers across the country talking about the importance of federal investment in research. Um, but the best part, I think, for us uh, as the founding members of the Golden Goose Award is when you see a member of Congress 
who maybe didn't quite grasp the uh, the importance and the value of, of of their role in the federal investment of um, of basic research is when they take a golden goose story and they start using it in the middle of a hearing as an example of silly sounding research that has gone on to have these enormous impacts. Um, we've had that happen every year since, since the inception of the award and it's been very powerful to see the stories that you have shared um, with these members and brought them in uh, to, to highlight to them the value of this work. Uh, Jim Cooper, who's our founding member of Congress, has this quote that he says every year, um, either at the luncheon with the awardees prior to the ceremony or at the ceremony, the old Native American quote about, tell me a fact and I'll learn, tell me a truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. And I think this is living proof each year when we share these stories uh, with these members and then they share them with their constituents with the American public on C-SPAN. Um, I think that's an, an incredibly powerful validating tool for us to point to uh, year after year. So we hope to give them three more stories this year that they can use. We want to hear stories from all of you, so please consider submitting a nomination for the next round of Golden Goose Awards. You can do that on our website, as you can see in the bottom of this slide, goldengooseawards.org slash nominate or nomination. Uh, we were looking for federally funded research that uh, maybe sounds silly or odd or obscure but ends up having this significant impact. Uh, if the impact has to be present, if, if you think you have a great idea but you're not completely sure if it was federally funded, you think it was, go ahead and submit. We will help you research it because we really want to hear your story. Um, if you're interested in sponsoring the award, the deadline for this year is a little bit tight and that it closes at 5 p.m. today, but there's always next year. Um, and we'd love to have your support. Uh, and we've, uh, I know there are uh, several people listening today whose organizations have supported in the past. We are incredibly grateful for that and, and try to highlight our sponsors wherever we can um, to elevate their contributions to the award. Um, this is just some information where you can find us tweet at us, watch us on YouTube, Facebook us, share our, we share our stories on Facebook too, and we encourage you to do that if you're, uh, if you like the Golden Goose Award on Facebook, and you can share those stories as they get released. Okay. <laughs> so this is Matt Owens again, and uh, we're very grateful to Julia and Aaron for um, walking us through um, how we tell stories with the Golden Goose Award. I want to emphasize something that uh, was said earlier, and that is uh, Jim Cooper's word. You know, if you tell a good story, it remains in a person's heart. We in the science community, we understand the importance of evidence. Evidence is great. We have all sorts of reports, and we were able to make fantastic arguments as professional advocates around this table and many other colleagues and folks on, the, on this webinar who are making their case to policymakers about why there's a great return on investment for federal investment and research. Uh, and you, we have you know, mounds of evidence and trends and charts and so forth. But sometimes you have to lead with the story so they'll hear the evidence and comprehend it. And that's really among the most powerful elements of the Golden Goose Award and why I, I think it's fair to say that Julie, Aaron, and I find this among the most rewarding of all the things that we do uh, in, uh, in, in our work as advocates for um, science. So um, we are now to the question portion of uh, the webinar. And uh, so we do invite you to submit questions. You can do so through the interface of the webinar. So we'll be looking for that. I have a few to get us started that I will ask to Julia and Aaron. Uh, and again, all three of us may uh, chime in on, on answers uh, that we hear, uh, that, to questions that we hear from you. So I'll start with, um, how do you decide what a golden goose story looks like? What boxes does it need to check? So this is Julia. I'll start with, um, I guess when we when we first started with the award, we actually had in mind some of the stories that, that wound up going on to have golden goose uh, awards. So we, several of us were familiar with the, the screw worm story. Um, so we tracked down the additional information that we needed for that. Um, so federally funded, silly sounding, or serendipitous twist, and impact, that can come in different ways. And for each story, I think it happens differently. 
um, you know, we have the biomedical impacts, which are always a, kind of an emotionally powerful, people have an emotionally powerful response to that. Um, but there's also um, economic impact. Um, last year with the honeybee algorithm, there was research, uh, the serendipitous twist came, they did the research, and sure, it was silly sounding. Um, and it wasn't until a year or two later when someone came knocking saying, I have a question about something completely unrelated that might have some correlation to this pattern that you found in, in honeybee research. Um, and, and the guy said, absolutely. And, and sure enough, they started working together. And it was honeybees somehow transitioning into computer servers. So certainly that, that impact doesn't have to necessarily, um, you know, have like an emotional twist to it. it just has to be like a powerful um, uh, impact as far as some aspect of our society. Yeah, that's 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 right, Julia. Um, the other thing I would add is that uh, the, there 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 are lots of a really amazing research projects that are happening right now that I think will have an impact, but at which we we. That, that we could maybe make some, some gosling, uh, gosling awards, but what we need to see is that discernible, defined impact right now. Um, and, and again, we are looking for federally funded research. Thank you both. Um, another question for you before we again turn to some uh, questions from all of you on the webinar. How do awardees respond when invited to receive the award? Uh, so this is Julie again. Uh, so I would say the first year um, we got very lucky in that our awardees uh, were very benevolent with us. Um, there was one awardee who thought that he was receiving the Golden Fleece Award, um, but was very patient with us on the phone and, and, and realized that, that this was in fact the opposite of, of that and was very excited about it. We were lucky in that we put our website up before we started calling people, so we, we, we were experiencing them Googling us while they were on the phone with us um, <laughs> to make sure that we were legit, legitimate. Um, and uh, all of them were very happy to receive the award. We did have Nobel laureates in the first year um, that were very moved, which was surprising for us. Uh, they all thought it was a great idea. Um, and I, I'll note, too, that all of them, when we got into why we call it the Golden Goose Award, uh, said that they they all had a deep connection to when the Proxmire Awards were happening, and it was like a visceral. They remembered it. Uh, none of them had a direct connection to to having uh, been awarded a, a Golden Fleece, but all of them were were deeply disappointed when they would read about them in the news, and they would share that disappointment with us. So it was. It was validating in a way for us to hear that, that not only were we doing this to kind of elevate federally funded research in the minds of members of Congress and, and their staff, but also um, that, that we were doing something for these researchers that is something that, that they were carrying with them for a long time, that this was, uh, this was them receiving this award meant something to them because they had experienced living through the Proxmire Awards and seeing federally funded research being attacked in a way that they, they that we had um, some of them saying, like, it was just wrong. You shouldn't have been doing that. Um, we agree. Um, so that was pretty cool. It's just wonderful to be able to share these stories of success, these happy, wonderful scientific yeah. breakthrough stories, and to be able to amplify them. And I, I just add, having been part of some of those very early awarding notification calls. As Julia said, I'll, I'll never forget the time that the first awardee said to us, ah, that's a real thing. And you could hear them typing on their keyboard <laughs> because they had Googled us and looked yeah. us up while they're in that conversation. So that was validating in year one. But one of the underpinnings of, of the award is when the founding organizations came together to, again, realize this idea by Representative Cooper, we determined that it's vital that this award have scientific integrity. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, so that it can, can it, it can be prestigious, so that Nobel laureates and uh, uh, scientists who win other awards um, uh, understand its inherent value, that it is scientific value, recognizes excellent work. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that we did very early on is we established a selection committee, not of people like, like myself or Julia or Aaron, but people who have deep expertise in different fields of science. And so they're the ones who consider the nominations that people like yourself on this webinar submit and others 
uh, and they're the ones who go through and make sure the science is sound. It's fundamental that they, they did something extraordinary, and they look at that societal and human benefit. So it's something that is very vital, and it, that gave instant credibility, I believe, to the awardees when they were looking that up. So thank you both for that answer. Um, we have a question from uh, one of our uh, participants, um, and I'll read it now. In what ways are children, K-12 students included, in award nominations, selection, education, and outreach? And have any Golden Goose Award stories been written for students? So to the latter part of that, I'd say no, but that's certainly an area where we could grow the award. Um, that's probably a bandwidth thing. Up, up until now, we haven't uh, um, been able to, to take the extra time to do that. Um, I actually really like the idea of a Golden Goose Award children's book, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, as far as K-12 through education, one thing we do each year is to reach out to um, local schools and uh, charter school systems to make sure that the science teachers are invited. To participate in the ceremony, we've we've also had um, university students. I think we've had one or two um, high school students um, that have a direct correlation to the award. Um, but I think that's probably another bandwidth thing that, as we continue to grow the award, that is one area where we would like to grow it. Um, but the including science teachers. Um, middle and high school science teachers was important to us once we've got a larger space because we wanted them to be another mouthpiece for these stories, to take these stories into the classroom to encourage their students um, with, these, with these fun educational examples of, of impactful research. Yeah, one, I would add one scientist who, uh, who I'd say is a friend of the Golden Goose Award, whose research has actually been challenged in the press, ended up making this nomination process part of a class project a class that she was doing. Yeah. And we got some great nominations from that. We've actually, yeah, we've awarded, I think, now three of the nominations that have come through for students. So we encourage, if you teach a, a class that bears on science policy, we absolutely encourage nominations as something to at least discuss and make the students aware of or even make it a class project. It really does yield benefit. That's right. That's where storytelling often begins. We remember this stories we learned as children. So this was a great suggestion. So I want to thank Mayo for that question and, and some new ideas for us. Um, I have another question I'd like to read. Uh, this is from Stephen Shepard. What are some key strategies a person can do to explain research through storytelling, specifically for research and concepts that are, are fairly, in quotes, dry? Uh, and I'm happy to make, me make a quick start at this. Uh, one of the things that I think we've learned through the Golden Goose Award and through other efforts where we've been talking with um, scientists and others that uh, are focused on um, how to better talk about science with the public is that we, we can't summarize the work to start. You have to grab a person's attention. What's the problem they're solving? Not, not this technical scientific name or the, the Latin name for, the, for the, the particular virus or species or whatever it is. It's talk about the problem you're solving and then how you did it. When the scientist or the engineer talks about their, their involvement and connection to the work, um, it humanizes it and makes the story more relatable, especially when you have to get into sort of the more dry details. And so an, an example of that would be, I, 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 for, I forget the person's name, but uh, we see this oftentimes um, when talking about, for instance, work that may have deep implications for human health. And you'll hear from a scientist who said, you know, the reason I became a scientist is uh, I was deeply affected by uh, my relative, my, my son, my, my daughter, uh, my grandmother, who, who has been afflicted by this form of cancer. And, and it got me asking, how can I make a contribution? And they realized they had a skill set. And so then they, they've identified a problem, what their personal connection is to it, and then they take it from there to, to help explain a little bit of the science and why it makes why it makes a difference. Um, Julia or Erin, anything else you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I, I would say uh, use, use analogies as much as you can or metaphors that relate your research to things that nearly everyone can relate to. One example, at AAAS we teach communicating science seminars, and one scientist 
described uh, different types of rocks as different types of desserts. Who doesn't love desserts? Uh, so that's, that's just one example of a way that you can make your research more accessible. And I have to put in a little plug here if you want to know more strategies. Just Google AAAS Communicating Science. There's all sorts of wonderful resources on our page. Um, I'd, I'd also add that, uh, you know, as Matt just did, making yourself a part of the story of your research in that when you, when someone asks you, you know, what are you, what are you working on, and it's this very complicated lab-only language that you have to get into, um, talk about, like, open with, well, this is why I started, I became interested in, um, this is what I work on. I would also, you know, if you're if you're federally funded, mention like that I, I receive funding from DOE because DOE is interested in this, and then maybe talk about the the broader implications of of the field of research that you're in and the impacts that that has had. Because maybe you're at a stage in your research where those in, implications aren't necessarily there, but that doesn't mean that that they won't eventually be there. And and even if it's you're just doing you know curiosity driven research that that will answer questions, um, but not necessarily change the world, that's still important. Um, and and emphasizing that I think is is um, emphasizing that in the role of like the broader field of like nanotechnology. If you have a very nuanced niche area that you're working on there. Talk about nanotechnology and the impact that that has had broadly. Just, just tie yourself into the, the broader story um, that, that people will have a connection to. And I cannot emphasize enough. We have schools that do this. We have schools that don't. If you receive federal funding, mention it in your press releases. Put it on your, if you have a page on your, on your a website um, that talks about your research, mention where it's coming from, make it like a second, um, just, a, just a habit to just constantly mention who is funding your research because the more people make that connection, um, the better off we all we all are to benefit from that. Yeah, my well, final thought on that is, uh, the, the postscript to that is also, thank taxpayers. Yes. The policymakers make the decision, it's federal funding, um, but you know, all of us help pay for that and I think recognizing that in, explaining that, hey, it's taxpayer money. This is a good investment. I think that's always important. Let me turn to our next question. Uh, this is from Laura. Research that results in societal impact is often funded by many different sources, including foundations and industry, as well as, of course, federal sources. Do you have a threshold for the contribution of federal funding in evaluating nominations? Uh, did you receive federal funding at any point? <laughs> In the in the process, usually earlier on. I mean, it's yeah. federally it's basic research, so it would, this would be funding that you would have gotten very early on in in, in the process of of, um, of the research. So if if you've already kind of seen a possible impact, and then uh, private industry started funding you, and then the federal um, federal investment came in at a much um, later stage. Um, that's going to be harder to, to for Golden Goose specifically to do the serendipitous um, aspect of it. I think we focus on that primarily because those stories, I think, are the the, the best ones for um, showing Congress that that federal investment is valuable because of that twist. Um, so specifically for Golden Goose, I would say early early investment, federal investment. Yeah, a number of our past stories have had funding from various. Sources or various federal agencies, and, and a number of them have brought together different disciplines that don't even mm -hmm. seem like they should be related in yeah. any way. Um, and then that's one of the things that makes the award so interesting. Uh, I think one other way to think about it is yeah, I think you summed it up well. It's really we're looking at what was the funding source at the moment of sort of that aha moment, the moment of discovery. It may have had a longer path and received all sorts of contributions from federal, um, excuse me, from non federal sources. Uh, but we're really looking at that early science. And if you look at uh, the awardees over the years, uh, many of their uh, ultimate impacts because of the things that the products or other processes that led, uh, that came from that original discovery, those things were, in fact, funded by industry to kind of see it through that development process. And the marshmallow study, which uh, 
had like 30 years of federal investment, but it all started with a young investigator award at the very onset of his work. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a great example uh, coming up uh, to be announced later this uh, later this month, where supported by a federal source, uh, fascinating uh, discovery. Uh, that industry really ran with at the end of the day. So I uh, hope I'm teasing you well enough that you will participate in our award ceremony. Um, let me turn to the next question. This is from Rob. I know that you're probably focused on 2017, but are you aware that next year's National Association of Science Writers annual meeting is in D.C. It's in October. Uh, this might offer some opportunities for discussing this with the public. Uh, Rob, thank you. That's a great <laughs> suggestion. We typically have the annual award ceremony in September, uh, but we are looking to make connections with writers. Uh, in this case, a fantastic organization with whom we have had some interactions in the past. We try to make sure the members of, uh, uh, of that association are aware of the award ceremony, and uh, you've given us some uh, food for thought about how we might uh, uh, maybe participate or at least pitch something to them yeah. uh, when they're in town in 2018. So thank you, Rob. We appreciate it. I'll, I'll add uh, at, at the AAAF annual meeting um, in, in Boston this year, there was a session where we, um, where we had two researchers who had had their work attack and how they responded to that. And one of the questions was similar to one of the questions we received earlier today about how do I help me tell my story so I don't become the victim of this or I have become the victim of this. How do I better tell my story? That um, the National Association of Science Writers was uh, quoted uh, to that group as a resource um, that if you are having uh, trouble, to reach out to them and to ask them for, for insight into how to better tell your story. I have another question. What are some key takeaways for researchers listening uh, in to apply the, the sort of the Golden Goose Award model of storytelling to their own research? We talked about this a little bit, but are there some other thoughts you'd like to offer here? I would just say the, the more, so to make my point earlier about um, continually message uh, who is supporting your work, um, where, that, where that funding is coming from, um, to make that second nature, um, but also um, to just share that I think the more people hear about federal investment in research, the better they understand that connection. Uh, just in, just in the, the years we've been working on the award, um, I think we've all changed the way we speak because we've become hyper aware of, of the role federal investment plays and how downplayed it is, even in our own university um, researchers talking about their work. Um, now we make a habit where we work at AAU with our universities when they're doing press releases. We tell them, hey, was this NSF funding? Because it doesn't, it doesn't say it was NSF funded. So let's put that in the press release, let's get that out there. When we highlight research on our website, that's the first thing, one of the first things that we mention. Um, there is, I think, a disconnect with the broader American public with how this research gets funded. They think it's entirely tuition dollars. Um, that's not true. Um, so the more it becomes a part of your narrative, the broader that message, or the broader audience that, re that message re reaches. I would say also, if you want to communicate your science to the general public, start small. It could be as simple as talking to your family around the dinner table and getting that practice in for how to tell your story simply. Uh, and I would also say, if you're not alone, reach out to your university press office or reach out to your scientific society you're a member of. These are places that can have resources that can help you learn to communicate your science and also help you find ways to do it. I'd add to this. Um, all scientists need to be excellent communicators. That's what it requires. This is the age in which we live. Uh, the explosion of information and communications that we've seen uh, in the late 20th century to where we are right now in this century, this is what it takes. And if we're going to continue to enjoy federal investments and the public trust that undergirds that federal investment, scientists and engineers need to be communicators. So I would encourage you as you think about if you're a researcher, uh, you know, you're, you're more than that. You need to be a communicator first when you're talking to uh, non-scientific audiences. I think that's critical. And you can make a difference in ways, just like Aaron just said, uh, namely by talking with the people uh, who are closest to you, your family, your friends, who are non-scientists. If you can communicate to them 
crisply what it is, then you have you have the ability to communicate to a broader audience. And, and in fact, you can do that with some of the communication tools we have. There's nothing that stops any one of you who are a researcher to make a very brief video uh, about your work and why it matters, who supports it, the problem you're solving. Um, we live in an age of social media. These are things that you can put out. Many of you have your own web pages where um, it's your personal, sometimes it's your professional web page. You can make your own videos and you can share that. And there are people out there in the community who can help do that. And we're part of that solution as well. So encourage you to think in those terms. Communicator first, then scientists, when you, when you again, when the task before you is to communicate. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this is from Kelsey. I find it particularly interesting that several awards have been posthumous. I do not recall if they were nominated posthumously or simply awarded too late. Uh, so, uh, so, also phrasing, I'm too late. Um, we do accept uh, posthumous nominations, um, and, and we have given them, I'd say uh, in many cases, those are some of our more powerful stories um, when we're sharing them at the award ceremony, because what we do is we reach out um, to the family members uh, and have them come, and, and they'll stand on stage. There's a question and answer session during the um, during the award ceremony, where uh, the awardees get to you know answer kind of fun questions uh, from our host Frank Sesno about their research and talk about the little nuances that got them to their aha moment. Um, but when we have the the relatives of the posthumous awardees, um, it's really powerful having someone talk about. Uh, their their father being an incredible mathematician, um, but also a devoted family person. You get like you almost get like a, a, a fuller picture of who they were, um, and it, it makes you appreciate their contributions um, all the more. Uh, there are uh, we have had a, um, an awardee or two that uh, has not medically been able to attend because of their age. Unfortunately, with when we when we make impact. Um, an aspect of the award, it, it kind of adds a, a, a timeline that our awardees tend to be a little bit older um, when they're receiving the award. So uh, that, that has been an issue, but we try to accommodate best we can. Um, we did have an awardee come last year who required a little bit of extra medical assistance getting onto the stage, but uh, uh, his son came with him, and it was, again, like a very powerful emotional moment as he took his father in a wheelchair across the stage, and he got his award. I would say there was not a dry eye in the house, but I can only speak for myself. Um, but yes, we do accept posthumous nominations um, and, and, and welcome them. So please submit if you have ideas. Yeah. The, the more nominations, the better, because uh, we, we are looking to ensure that we're recognizing awesome, wonderful past achievements. Sometimes that is 30 or 40 years ago. In other cases, uh, it can be just five to 10 years ago, mm -hmm. but we've got to have the story. So we really encourage uh, your nomination. Um, we do hope, as we've indicated earlier, that you'll be able to join us, whether in person for the September 27th Golden Goose Award Ceremony. This is our sixth uh, annual award ceremony. Or you do have the option to uh, watch the ceremony by webcast. Uh, we encourage webcasting parties uh, so that gather, gather, your, uh, gather your lab mates, your classmates, uh, your fellow researchers, your department, uh, your department head, but uh, find a venue in which uh, you can webcast this and all can watch. Uh, we encourage that. We think it would be fantastic. Uh, most importantly, if you haven't learned anything from today's webinar, um, I, I, you know, it, we ask that you tell a friend, that you, you, you tweet about it, you Facebook about it, you help us tell the story, share the stories that we've already brought to light. Uh, they can't be told enough, frankly. Uh, there's an entire, um, you know, large segment of, uh, of audience that we need to get to if we're going to continue to demonstrate that federal investments make a huge societal impact and, and do make a difference. Uh, and so we need more messengers. The folks on today's webinar are part of that, um, that army, so to speak. And so we do encourage you, if anything, go home and tell your significant other, your brother, your sister, your best friend, tell them about this if, they don't, if they're not aware of it and ask them to tell somebody else. Um, that makes a difference, and we know that because we see the success growing year after year after year. So with that, uh, I want to thank Aaron and Julia for all, their, uh, for all their uh, comments and, and help. Thank you all for submitting questions. Thank you to Darren for uh, making sure we uh, stayed uh, 
orderly and had, were able to answer your questions and, and keep the, the technical part of this going, and uh, we appreciate it. And please tune in for the next ESEP webinar, which will be uh, sent to you by way of email in the coming uh, uh, days and weeks. Thank you all.